stop the car. You got the wrong colors on this thing. Yeah, I'd like to welcome everyone <laughs> to our meeting this evening and ask everyone to rise for the invocation led by Commissioner Bill Brunson and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Commissioner Wayne Neal. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity, the privilege we have to gather tonight in a free society. Father, we thank you for this great nation that uh, you have so blessed us with. We thank you for this great community that you've allowed us to work and to live and to serve. And Lord, we ask your special blessing tonight for our first responders, for those that put their lives on the line every day for our safety. And uh, Father, we thank you for our military, those home and abroad who are, are protecting us and Father, we just uh, ask that you keep them in, out of harm's way. Father, we pray your blessing on our meeting tonight and we give us wisdom and discernment in what we do and that uh, our actions would bring glory to you and be for the greater good. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, please be seated. The um, first item uh, on the agenda tonight is public comment period. We have one uh, citizen signed up, and if he would come up to the podium, Mr. Julian Smith, please come up to the podium and state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Julian Smith. I live on St. Simon's Island. And I understand I'm the only person who signed up to speak to you tonight. Uh, I wish others had. Uh, OK. As I am the only member of the public who has signed up for the public comment tonight, two of my multiple personalities will each speak for five minutes after I speak, me, myself, and I. So. 15 minutes, you good with that? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Never mind. Yes, sir. My yes, chief sir. reason for signing on, uh, <laughs> uh, signing up on Tuesday morning to speak tonight was to ask you to have the SPLOS 2020 vote uh, at the general election in November, not at the primary election in May, as was indicated um, on the agenda. Um, now, I understand from reading the Brunswick News yesterday, saw the headline, that the county pushes SPLOS vote to November. I'm glad you're doing that. Uh, and I have somewhere here the, uh, the ch change in the agenda. Um, and I wish you would, after I speak, uh, go through the formal process of amending the agenda so you can remove item 19 and then vote on item 20. And of course, if item 20, the November uh, vote on the SPLOS, if that vote fails, then you can, someone can uh, move to go back and vote on 19 again. That's a simple procedure. Um, anyway. Uh, so I, I hope you're gonna have the SPLOS vote in November so there'll be lots of time uh, to hear from the public on this matter and that you will, have the same, you will not have the same kind of poorly attended public meetings that you had four years ago when I spent about $25,000 on ads opposing the SPLOS, those billboards, newspaper ads, radio ads, and the SPLOS passed by only 54%. Don't make me have to go after this SPLOST uh, again. I hope you will amend it and it will be simpler. And I hope that the public hearings are not like the dog and pony shows we had four years ago where there were lots of dogs and no pony. Uh, moving on. Uh, let me quote from the uh, front page of the Brunswick News on Tuesday morning, quote, State legislators are considering local legislation to let Glen County voters choose whether or not to leave the Golden Isles law enforcement in the hands of the Glen County Police Department or to fold it into the Glen County Sheriff's Office, unquote. I, I hope 
there will be a vote, and I hope the voters will say, let's have the seven county commissioners responsible for telling the county administrator to tell the police chief to shape up or ship out. Uh, if we turn police powers in Glen County over to the uh, sheriff's office, that means the voters get to elect only one person, the sheriff. Uh, and sheriffs are typically hard to remove. So please keep uh, the ability to tell the, to fight to keep the ability to tell the county administrator uh, to tell the police chief uh, what he needs to, to know. Uh, all right. Now, um, that article went on to have a quote from uh, uh, Don Hogan. Um, and let me quote him. And he said, uh, according to this article, um, our state, <laughs> let me quote, I think the voters ought to have a right to vote on almost anything, unquote. That's, that's Don Hogan, to vote on almost anything. Well, I hope you will encourage Don Hogan to uh, agree that we need to have a vote on St. Simons, by the people on St. Simons, about whether or not they would like to incorporate. And then maybe in five years, the people who live around, along Harry Driggers might want to vote on whether they will incorporate to get out from under the control of the county commission uh, in, in terms of zoning and so on. Uh, enough. Uh, finally, I want to say I'm, I'm glad to see uh, so many candidates coming out of the woodwork to run for the county commission. Uh, we, we know that... Um, uh, Sammy Tosterson is going to be running um, in District 1 to give uh, Chairman Browning someone to, uh, to debate uh, if, you, if you plan to, to run. Cap Fendig is running uh, for the uh, district seat uh, on St. Simons Island, District 2. Uh, and let's see, uh, former commissioner, okay, Cap Fendig, I mentioned. I don't have my reading glasses on. And uh, Bo Clark and Walter Rafalski are running for the at-large seat now held by Commissioner Coleman. Um, and I hope that uh, Commissioner Booker will have a good opponent, will give him an opportunity <laughs> to talk about his vision uh, for, for the city of Brunswick and for the 5th District. So, uh, thank you. I, only, I took more than five minutes, but uh, I gave you back the, the other ten. Thank you. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. Could you tell me how many thousands of dollars you spent on that last post? I, <laughs> I, I couldn't hear what you said, sir. How, how many thousands of dollars did you spend on that last post? <laughs> about 25. I was also running for office. I spent yeah. about 40,000. Yeah. A little over 40,000. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That is, that is, that is involvement at its finest. I, I appreciate that. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> I think we need to add something to the agenda at this time, so y'all bear with us. <clears throat> you want to go ahead and do that now? <laughs> yeah. I assume. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to add item 20 to the agenda to consider changing the target election date for the special purpose local option sales tax 2020 referendum from May the 19th, 2020 to November 3rd, 2020 and remove item number 19 from the agenda. Uh, we have, okay, gentlemen, we have a motion. We have a second on the floor. Uh, any discussion? Okay, I'll call the motion. All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. That is unanimous. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have Adam <coughs> added item 20, and we have removed item 19 at the same time. Um, okay. For the next item, we have the um, 12 U All Star Football Team, the Red Death. If we could, I'm on, we're going to read a proclamation, but I want to get them on up here to the front. Right up here, uh, Coach Altman, come on up with you. Any, anybody else? Let's get them on up here. So when we read this proclamation, everybody can see who we're. Yeah, yeah, right up through here. Um, 
This is the Red Death coming up. <laughs> really? So, man, look at that. Yeah, we're going to get a little, get them in the spotlight up here. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, y'all 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 come on in down here and kind of kind of get up here in a big old group. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, some of y'all filter down this way. Coach Altman, you got anybody else on your staff you want to bring up? Uh, I've got my defensive coordinator coach Scott Morrison. Uh, uh, coach Sean Walker couldn't be here tonight. I believe he's at work and coach Joe Blaney is out of town. Okay, okay. All right, this, this, uh, if we got everybody up here, we, we're going to read this proclamation. Just bear with me, then we're going to come down and uh, present it. Okay, proclamation, recognizing Glen County Recreation and Parks 12U All-Star Football 2019 State Champion Celebration Day. Whereas the 2019 Glen County Recreation and Parks Department 12U All-Star Football Team also known as Red Death, demonstrated great athleticism and determination in competing in the Georgia Recreation and Park Association All-Star Football Program, and as a result, achieved tremendous success, and whereas this incredible team finished the GRPA All-Star Football Tournament with a 7-0 record, scoring a total of 122 points, while allowing only 43 points to be scored by their opponents, and whereas, under the leadership and guidance of head coach Bart Altman and assistant coaches Scott Morrison, Sean Walker, and Joe Delaney, the team won its first GRPA Class B State Football Championship on December 14, 2019, with an exciting 8-6 to six victory over the Carrollton Parks and Recreation Department 12U All-Star Football Team. And whereas the Glen County Board of Commissioners wishes to congratulate the players, coaches, and parents for their hard work and dedication in winning the state championship. And whereas the team has brought great honor and pride not only to themselves, but also to the Glen County Recreation and Parks Department and the Glen County community. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Glen County Board of Commissioners that it hereby recognizes the 2019 Glen County Red Death football players for demonstrating tremendous athletic talent and the coaches for dedicating their time and enthusiasm to lead this team to the GRPA Class B State Football Championship and proclaim today, January 16, 2020, as Glen County Red Death Football Championship Celebration Day in Glen County. Um, I think we should all just stand and give a big uh, hand of applause. And, Church here. You can really do that. I can do it. It was one of my New Year's resolutions. I went on Google. <laughs> I had about 15 hooked up. I learned how to tie a double <laughs> into high school, and that's as far as I ever got.
tell you what, they dressed appropriately with their sweatshirts. Yeah. I feel like we're in Alaska. I, I can't get a piece of it. Last week, it was 104 degrees. <laughs> this on the bench. I will have it. I will have it. Yeah. <laughs> but commissioners, I, I do want to tell y'all this. The best thing y'all can do in this community is make sure that we always have a top shelf, best recreation department that we can have. Because when you do that, you get young men like this that are just, just you won't do, don't, miles, miles, miles. <laughs> yes, sir. The only thing I've ever heard this young man say is yes, sir, and no, sir. <laughs> Guys, we turned the air conditioner down to about 40, so you'd be comfortable in your sweat in your, in your sweatshirt. <laughs> Now, now, who 
You got one of them rings? Yeah. Well, I know they are thrilled. They are thrilled. Well, that's that's a big that's a big achievement too. That's a big achievement. Okay, as AE's on out, we're going to go to item two. Uh, receive a report on the comprehensive annual financial audit. Uh, Ms. Munson, if you want to come up and just. Good evening, commissioners. Good to see you all again. That's going to be a tough act to follow. You know that, right? I know. Okay. Well, I decided that y'all would appreciate short and sweet since this might be my last presentation. I made it very short and sweet for y'all and the audience, so it'll only be a few minutes this time, as opposed to my normal ones. Um, Thank you for um, giving us a little bit longer to finish the audit this year. I appreciate that extension, um, and, and it really was just due to my schedule. So thank you very much for your consideration on that. Um, so we finished our fiscal year 19 audit. We actually just printed these today, so I know you have not had a chance to look over them. As you're looking, if you come across things you have questions on, you're still welcome to email me or, or call me, and I'll be glad to, to talk to you. Um, but just to go over our audit, um, the auditor's results, we had a financial statement audit, which is the front part of the CAFR. We had an unmodified clean opinion, which meant that we had no material weaknesses, significant deficiencies, there, so there were no findings that were identified by the auditors this year. And um, our statements are presented fairly in accordance with GAAP. And so that's what their opinion says, their opinion letter in the front. Then we also had a federal award single audit. And a single audit happens when an entity gets 750,000 or, 750, or more in federal grant dollars. So we normally do not have a single audit. It used to be 500. When the level was 500, we had them more often. But with this one, um, we had a single audit this year because of our FEMA money that we got. So we again had an uh, unmodified clean opinion and we had no findings in the single audit. And they went through all of our FEMA records. Um, our ending total fund balances in our governmental funds, and again, this is total fund balances. For the general fund, 56 million. SPLOST 2016, 19 million. And our non-major governmental funds, 19.2 million. Our, propri our proprietary funds, the airport is considered a fund of the county, and their ending fund balance was 56 million, solid waste collection 2.6 million, and then we have a couple of um, non-major proprietary funds that was 107,000 total. And then we have our pension trust fund, and that's considered a fiduciary fund, ended at 105 million. So I know that your main focus on what everyone wants to talk about is what do we have in the general fund, so I wanted to just highlight that a little bit. Um, you can see here, if I know it's very small, but um, the last four years of general fund fund balance history. Um, I want to point out that here in this committed number for 2019, this 30 million includes our, rain, our rainy day fund, our um, revenue stabilization is in there. And then the other 658,000 is other things that we um, had to commit to put in that number. So your undesignated fund balance, your total fund balance is 56 million, but your undesignated was 23.6 million at the end of fiscal year 19. Um, just keep in mind this is as of June 30th, 2019, so anything that you have voted on since then to come out of fund balance is not included in this number. Um, also, the Coleman lawsuit was not taken out of that number. So your actual undesignated fund balance is somewhere around 16 or 17 million now. 
Um, here you can see the blue is your committed. So we went, we dipped down in our committed funds when we used it for the hurricane, and now we're back up to our 30 million threshold. And the green is undesignated, so that's monies that you can spend, and you can see we have steadily risen, and we had a really good year in fiscal year 19. We ended with a great undesignated fund balance. Um, I put a chart in here that just kind of breaks up our revenues by source. We had 40% um, of our revenues in governmental funds came from property taxes. 41% came from other taxes. So that is lost, alcohol, hotel, motel, um, business taxes, all of those things fall into that 41%. And then the rest of our revenue is split up in, in these other smaller categories. And then our expenditures by function, our largest expenditure was public safety with 40% of all governmental expenditures in public safety, 27% in public works, and then the rest of it is split up among these smaller categories here. So I, um, that's really all I have for you, and I'm here to answer any questions that you have, and I'll be glad to answer questions later too as you start looking through your CAFR. Would you go back to the I think second or third slide there. They're right there. Go back. This one? All right. You said the twenty three million of undesignated did not include the Coleman. Correct, because this is as of June thirtieth and we didn't pay out the Coleman lawsuit until November. So we had to report this as of June thirtieth. So it's not it's in this un unassigned fund balance number here, but it's you truly have to subtract that to know where you're at now. So also the the FEMA money that came in, did that go into that? It went back into the rainy day fund to bring us back up to the 30 million. Uh -huh. So we put all of the FEMA money in there and then we also took some of the undesignated money and put it into that so that we could be fully funded at 30 million. So we're still outstanding on some FEMA funds that haven't been reimbursed yet. Um, but as they come in, they will go into the undesignated fund because now our rainy day fund is fully funded. Got it. Okay, thank you. Tamara, how much is outstanding on the hurricane reimbursement from FEMA? I believe it's around two and a half million, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Do you have any idea? I, I'm, I, I think it's around two and a half million, um, and we don't know. If it, it could be a couple of years before they close those out, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, was just, I was just curious about the number. I mean, I know it. I know it may take us a while if we ever get it. Yeah. So uh, just just curious what, if, if we get it all, what it might be, but two and a half million. Uh, uh, commissioners, y'all have any questions for Tamara? <clears throat> Where is the, uh, the findings page for the regular audit? I found it on the single audit, but. Um, it is going to be. Is it in the financial section? It's. <sighs> it, that's a single audit. Okay, so because we had audit. because we had no findings, they actually combined it. So if you look on um, page eight H seven, it tells you that we had no financial statement findings and no federal awards findings. Oh, so that's both of them. Yeah. Okay, all right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, okay. Uh, there being no more questions, Terry, we thank you very much. Thank and you. Uh, if, if this is indeed your last time before us, I just want to tell you we, we're going to miss you and we appreciate all that you have done since you've been here. And uh, you're doing a great job. Thank you. I will miss y'all as well, but I know I'm leaving it in good ha good hands. So yeah. um, again, I'm I'm still available if you have questions sure. for for a while. <laughs> Tamara, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, public hearings, alcoholic beverage license. 
Public hearings will be limited to 30 minutes for each opposing side, with five minutes allocated to each individual speaker. Comments are to be limited to relevant information regarding your position and should avoid being repetitious. If your group has a spokesperson, please allow that individual to present your group's position in a time allocated. Your cooperation in this process will be greatly appreciated. Item three, <clears throat> consider the issuance of a 2020 alcoholic beverage license to Dante Habersham for Mr. Shucks Unlimited Incorporated DBA Mr. Shuck Seafood 107 Altama Connector, Brunswick, Georgia. The license is to sell malt beverages and wines for consumption on premise of a restaurant. Sunday sales permitted. Dante Habersham, licensee. Uh, Chief? Mr. Chairman, uh, Board of Commissioners, uh, the applicant has met all the requirements as articulated by the statute. He is present. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Okay, this is a public hearing. All those, <coughs> all those in favor of the application that want to come up to the podium and speak in favor of the application, you're welcome to do that. All those in favor of the application, if you want to come up to the podium and speak in favor of it, you're welcome to do that. Okay. Um, we'll move on to all those that may be opposed to the application. If you want to step up to the podium, please do. Anyone opposed to the application? Okay, it's a public hearing, and I'm going to close the public hearing. Uh, commissioners. Mr. Chairman, I move that we um, approve the issuance of a 2020 alcohol beverage license to Mr. Shucks Unlimited, Inc. Second. Commissioners, we have a motion second on the floor. Any further discussion? <clears throat> okay, hearing none. Um, I call the motion. All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. That is unanimous. Um, Mr. Habersham, congratulations. You're good to go, buddy. Thank you. Okay, item four. <clears throat> Consider the issuance of a 2020 provisional alcoholic beverage license to Samuel David Hamby for Chard Oak LLC, DBA Chard Oak, 134B Retreat Plaza, St. Simons Island, Georgia. The license is to sell distilled spirits, malt beverages, and wines for consumption on premise of a restaurant. Sunday sales permitted. Samuel Hamby is the um, licensee. Um, I wanna also add, <clears throat> A provisional license does not entitle the applicant to sell alcoholic beverage, beverages until all necessary work at the premises has been inspected and approved by the county. A certificate of occupancy issued and an alcoholic beverage license issued by the license officer. Okay, Chief. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Board of Commissioners, uh, Mr. Hamby is present uh, for any questions as required by the ordinance. Where's Mr. Hamby? Okay. Um, thank you, Chief. Uh, commissioners. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a um, this is a public hearing. Um, anyone wants to speak in favor of the license application? Step up to the podium and state your name for the record. I'm still Julian Smith. Uh, I didn't see anyone else coming up, so I thought I should. Uh, you know me. I, I support almost all alcoholic uh, beverage licenses, uh, particularly for restaurants. Uh, we need more restaurants uh, where people can have a drink and with their food. So, yes, and thank you for uh, explaining what, a, what the provision was, because that was not on the, the agenda statement. So uh, I expect and hope you will pass this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else want to get up and speak in favor of the application? Okay, we'll move on to those opposed. Anyone opposed to the application? Step up to the podium. Uh, anyone opposed to the application? Seeing none, hearing none, we're going to close the public hearing. And commissioners, what do you want to do? Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the issuance of a 2020 provisional alcoholic beverage license to Charred Oaks LLC doing business as Char Oaks. Second. 
appears to have a motion and a second on the floor. Any further discussion? Okay, I'll call the motion. All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. Okay, that is unanimous. Mr. Hamby, you have your provisional license. Thank you, sir. Public hearing, land use. Item number five, SUP 4018. Captain's Bluff Special Use Permit. Consider a special use permit application to operate a wedding and event venue at 300 and 425 Stevens Road, St. Simons Island. The permit request is limited to the area surrounding 300 Stevens Road. The 132.74 acre parcel is on forest agricultural and conservation preservation. Uh, a place of large public assembly, um, i.e. an event venue, is a special use and in the F.A. Zoning District. In this F.A. Zoning District. Parcel ID 04-01042, Philip Allen, Captain's Bluff, LLC, owner and applicant. Okay, hey, Steffi, you want to? Good evening, Commissioner. Stephanie Leaf, Planning Manager. This is SUP 4018, Captain's Bluff, and it is a special use permit. So the property is a little over 132 acres, and it is forest agricultural and conservation preservation dual zoning. And the comprehensive land use map for this area is coastal marshlands. And this is the property uh, located where the star is. So this is on the north part of the island, um, accessed off of uh, the very northern part of Frederica. And then you'd come down Stevens Road, and then Stevens Road um, kind of veers off to the right at the very end, and um, it's a, this is the marsh location. So as uh, we noted, there is a, it is a very large parcel at over, over 130 acres. Uh, but they are proposing to only have the event venue um, surrounding 300 Stevens Road, which is really right, the, right in this area where the star is located. The rest of the property will not um, be used for the events. Uh, so uh, for in the Forest Agricultural Zoning District, uh, a place of large public assembly, which is how we've been defining special event venues, um, is a special use permit. So the applicants um, are asking to have a maximum of 12 events per year. Um, each event would have a maximum of 200 guests. Uh, the parking on site is quite limited. Uh, they do have a gravel driveway and a circular gravel area where they would have their parking. Uh, but so the majority um, of attendees would be coming in via a trolley or shuttle, which would be, um, so they'd park off site and have a trolley or shuttle come into the property. And so really the only um, people that would be parking on site would be event staff, and then they do have um, a short-term rental units, and so anyone who, who is staying in those rental units would, would also park on site as well. Uh, they recently did upgrade their septic system, um, so they have received approval from Environmental Health for the upgraded septic system, and their max is actually 200 people, so that, that is their max on the septic system as well. Uh, and they, have, um, they have a private well on the property that serves the property, and they uh, recently got that tested and also passed inspection with Environmental Health as well. So this is the future land use map. Um, this whole area is coastal marshlands. And then this area that's kind of the, um, sort of the yellow over here, this is medium density residential, and the property is right here. So they did submit a spe sketch plan with their application um, showing where uh, the different aspects of the um, event venue will, will take place. So they do um, have everyone coming in through this road. Um, as I mentioned, the parking is very limited though and they'll be coming in from off-site. And there are no new structures proposed. Um, there is an open lawn area, so all the events will take place in, on the lawn area. They'll bring in tents for the event, and then the tents will go away after the event. Uh, there's also no catering kitchen. All the catering um, and food service for the events will be brought into the site for the event, and they would set up a tent for, um, for that catering, you know, or if it's a mobile vendor, um, but there's no permanent structures. Uh, they also cannot use um, any of the short-term rental housing as a commercial kitchen, so they can't do any food preparation for the events in the kitchens of the homes as well. They do have um, a small bathroom on site that has two, two bathrooms in it, just a small structure, so that bathroom would serve for the events. 
So um, the IPC had held two different meetings on this project, and uh, between those meetings, the applicant had submitted some proposed conditions, um, just um, responded to some of the concerns that were coming up from commissioners and members of the public. So this is a list of what the applicant submitted for conditions that they are comfortable with, that they are proposing. And this was also in your, in your packet. So just generally, um, that they would shut off music at 10 p.m., um, they, all the food would be prepared um, um, at a different location, not on any of the kitchens. Um, the parking would be off-site, and um, that events will only happen that open field uh, by the marsh by 300 Stevens Road. So here's some photos of the site. This is the gravel drive coming in. Uh, the structure you see is one of the short-term rental houses on the property. This is the open lawn where the majority of events do take place. This is um, kind of standing near the marsh and the river looking towards the, the house on the property. Uh, this structure to the left is, is the bathroom facility. And then just another view, this is the bathroom facility and the open lawn. And just more, uh, more photos of just the lawn area where the tents would be erected for the events. Um, these are from the Captain's Bluff website, captainsbluff.com. These do show an area view of the property. So this is the property um, with an event set up, so just to kind of show what, what the tent would look like and what the, where the location would be. Uh, so the Planning Commission, the Island Planning Commission, uh, did um, hold two, two different meetings. So they did hold a um, public hearing that was duly noticed for October 15, 2019. And uh, they held that public hearing and closed that hearing that night. Um, did have some discussion and deliberation on the, on the application. There was some additional information they wanted from the applicants, uh, specifically in regard to the septic and well. Um, there, were still, um, there still hadn't been the final permits issued from environmental health for the septic and well, so the IPC um, primarily wanted to wait for that information to come in before making a final decision. So um, on October 15th, the IPC did defer the application to the next meeting, which is November 19th of 2019. Uh, the applicant had, def had consented to this deferral, uh, so they did continue to do that. On November 19th, um, they did not hold a public hearing, however, they did open the floor for public comment. So they did receive some public comment that night, but it was not technically a public hearing. Uh, the IPC um, uh, held, held a vote, but because they did not get four votes affirmative, uh, for, affirmative for denial or affirmative for approval, uh, the motion did not pass, and so um, we did have one commissioner absent that night, Commissioner Ragsdale, and then Commissioner DiPolito had recused herself um, from the discussion and the vote. So um, the reason the application did move forward to the Board of Commissioners um, is even though there was not a, a final action taken by the IPC on November 19th, the application has been in process for well over 60 days, and according to our ordinance, Section 1103B4 of the Zoning Ordinance, um, after 60 days, if there is no final vote and the applicant has not consented in writing to having this application go beyond 60 days, then um, the application does move forward. And so that is why it was noticed for your agenda this evening. So these are your possible actions to um, prove the special uses presented, approve it with modifications or conditions, um, defer the action, remand it back to the IPC, or deny it. And then I did put this slide up um, for discussion purposes. These are some possible conditions of approval. At the November 19th meeting, the IPC did talk about some of the conditions that the applicant had proposed. Um, and so I just um, kind of pulling together part of the discussion from the November 19th and what the applicant had proposed. You know, these were just a few thoughts um, from staff on what might be acceptable conditions, you know, if it was your purview to, um, to approve it with conditions tonight. So I just wanted to have that up there for your discussion. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I know the applicants are here this evening as well. Uh, Tiffany, I have a question. Would you repeat why this came before us tonight? Sure. So um, let me go back to that slide. Um, so according to this um, Section 1103B4 of the Zoning Ordinance, um, 
what it states is that if a, an application has been in process over 60 days from the date of filing um, and the Planning Commission has not taken any formal action, uh, then at that point is considered a recommendation for approval by the IPC or by the Planning Commission and it does move forward to the Board of Commissioners um, for your consideration. And that, that is the case with this. Um, the application officially was submitted back in April of 2019 and um, it did take quite a bit of time to really get the application so that it was considered complete um, because it was missing some pieces. And so uh, really from planning and zoning, it was considered complete on September 23rd of 2019 and um, by the date of November 19th, you know, that was the meeting where they um, was the final meeting to IPC and November 23rd would have been 60 days from September 23rd. So ultimately, the reason it's before us tonight is because the IPC didn't have adequate, adequate attendance uh, for a formal vote. Is that, is that what you're saying? They had adequate attendance. They had a quorum that night, um, but because there was a, um, but because there was some, you know, one member that had recused plus one absence, um, and there were not enough votes either direction, so not enough in favor of approving it, not enough in favor of denying it. Um, they, you know, could not, you know, reach a vote of four votes. So. So they, did anybody suggest that they just defer it and look at it again when everybody was there? So they had deferred it from October 15th to November 19th. So they had deferred it once, and um, on November 19th, um, our county staff had advised them that because of the 60 days and they were running up against that, there really wasn't a way to defer it any f further because they were already, you know, so close to that 60 days. Uh, commissioners, y'all, uh, any of the rest of you have any questions for Steffi? Uh, so, Stephanie, it was voted two to three to de deny it, is that correct? That is correct, and actually there were two different votes that night. So the first, the first vote that came up um, was to approve it with conditions, but that, that did not pass. That was a three to one vote, so we had three in favor of approving it with conditions, um, one opposed to that vote, um, one and then one abstaining and then one recusal. Um, so that so there were actually two votes that night. The final vote was was to deny, and you know there weren't any other votes after that. But neither vote had four four votes in favor, so neither vote passed. Just just for my uh, edification, the IPC doesn't have final approval for a zoning change. And that this, is th this is a zoning change. It is a zoning change, and they're so a recommending body. It would if it were. Um, it's theoretically remanded back to the IPC and it was voted down, it would still come to the Board of Commissioners. Is that? That is correct, Thank yes. You. Stephen, did, um, did they, I want to make sure that I understood it correctly, did uh, the Allens file for or give a letter of extension? Uh, because there, we received a letter that said they did, but uh, I believe your report says they did not. Is that correct, an indefinite extension? Right, so what, um, what the letter was most likely referring to was uh, several months back, there had been no action um, taken by the applicants to kind of move the project forward. So it had been uh, submitted back in April. We were working with them to get some additional information, um, like a sketch plan and some of the information to really deem it as a complete submittal. So it took several months for really all of that to happen. So at one point, there really hadn't been any action. And our policy is, uh, if there hasn't been any action on an application for a good bit of time, we send them a letter saying that they have 30 days to um, do a resubmittal or contact our office stating that they want to keep the application open and they are still you know, actively working on it. Um, so what we had done was we had sent them the letter stating you have 30 days to respond. Um, they did submit a letter back to us stating we want to keep the application open and that was what they stated and then we responded saying you know, thank you and we'll continue to process this. So the difference there is that there was no um, written consent um, directly stating that we consent to a 30 or a 60 day extension or anything along those lines. It was just a general, yes, we want to keep our application open. Thank you. And Stephanie, as it, it pertains to the letter that we received 
last evening from Mr. Bell, uh, an attorney. Uh, I'd like clarification on the process to make sure that we have adequately performed as, as a board of commission that the IPC, um, uh, when, when they talked about uh, the deferral, should a new notice have gone out and, and should that notice, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to bring that into the record as to what those qualifications are and, uh, and, and a formal response in, in this meeting to uh, the letter that we received last evening from uh, Jordan Bell. Please, sir. Certainly, commissioners. Uh, that letter had multiple parts to it, so I want to make sure I'm <coughs> addressing uh, the pro parts properly, but uh, I have reviewed the letter and, and, and do not see anything, legally speaking, that would impair this board's right to take action this evening. Uh, that's, the, that's my short response to it. Um, I can certainly address the specific parts or subparts of that uh, as, as the Could board Could you wishes. repeat that first part? Uh, I didn't I, you. The, the letter, I, I, have not, I did not see anything in that letter that would impair or stop this board from taking action this evening on the application. Um, I certainly think you can remand it back down to the IPC with, with instruction to take a vote one way or another um, within a set period of time if that uh, pleases the board. But as far as um, you know, the parts of the letter that uh, said that that would be improper for the board to take action this evening, I, I do not agree with that. Um, as far as that you being prohibited to take that, uh, that action, I think there was one uh, part about it that uh, suggested that the uh, second meeting did not have a, uh, a properly noticed public hearing um, with advertisement. Uh, that wasn't necessary. The IPC had already had a public hearing that was properly noticed. You don't have to have a second public hearing by your ordinance. One public hearing that's properly noticed is all that's necessary. So the second hearing would not have needed to follow that, that, uh, that same process, although there was a public comment uh, uh, period where people could make public comments on that. So I disagree with that being an impediment this evening. Um, also, as far as the um, 60 day notice and the uh, email that was exchanged with staff, we have looked at that um, and that's not tantamount to the requisite notice that uh, 1103 B4 would require. Uh, we don't interpret that as the uh, applicant's consent or the authorization to uh, extend the period. Uh, that, that provision's there so that these applications just don't languish um, at the IPC level. Um, and that action is taken if, uh, because they're not the final authority on these, you are the final authority, it comes up to you anyway. Um, so uh, we, we don't think that was the consent, uh, and we don't interpret it as the consent or authorization. As, as uh, Ms. Leaf uh, was note, uh, mentioning, that was in reference to a, a preliminary process that they were undergoing, but not the, uh, the, the consent that is envisioned by 1103 uh, B4. Uh, those are the main points that I, I gleaned from the letter. If there's other subparts of that, I'm happy to address those uh, as well. Okay, and and I agree with you on the consent. I, I think that is pretty self-evident. I'm I'm concerned with the 60-day, uh, the the time period in that, making sure that nothing was circumvented to to um, shortchange uh, a public hearing. And, uh, and I'm, I'm concerned with the second notice. I, I, I just wanted to make sure that we're sure. clear in that. I, I'm not asking you to sure. repeat yourself, but, but those were my, my two biggest concerns, <coughs> that to, to know that we have uh, proceeded diligently in, in this and, and not uh, circumvented the people's right to know and, and people's right to comment. No, sir. Uh, I, I do not see that at all in this process. Um, they did, in fact, have a public hearing. That public hearing was <coughs> noticed properly. Um, when it was deferred uh, to another meeting, they don't have to have another public hearing. Um, that second hearing, that second meeting does not have to be, um, have another public hearing that uh, undergoes the same uh, 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 public hearing uh, process. They already had that, and that's all that's required by um, if the uh, zoning ordinances to have one public hearing, not two. They had that, they deferred it, um, so there's not a requirement to have a second public hearing. So the, the, the process was not circumvented, it was adhered to, um, and we feel like it's, again, properly before this board for a decision this evening. Okay, and, and there's plenty of state uh, precedents in this matter to, to ensure that this process is a 
proper and legal process? Absolutely. State law requires uh, one public hearing, um, and that's uh, before this board. So uh, not only do we have a public hearing, according to our ordinances, for uh, zoning decisions before this board, our board of commissioners has another public hearing at the IPC or our mainland planning commission level. So we actually have two public hearings where state law requires one. So we have double the public hearings, one at pub, uh, planning commission level and one at board commissioners level. So we not only uh, adhere to state law, we, we, we go a step further than that. Thank you. So would the, uh, uh, Steph, the, even though you say the second one wasn't necessary, the second public hearing wasn't necessary or necessarily required but my question is how did the how did the uh, area residents there they knew it had been deferred but had how would they have known about the second uh, uh, you know when it was deferred how would they have known about the second um, so the, the yeah. second, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, what I'm saying though is, you know, if you, you're only required to have one public hearing, okay? You have that public, hear, you have that public hearing and you defer it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, simplicity, you go put the public hearing sign up, you let it, it's deferred, you go take the public uh, hearing sign down. So, I mean, where does it go as far as the general public goes? How do they know what the next step is? Sure. So the, the public hearing was not deferred. The public hearing was held. Um, so that once that, that public hearing is done and closed, the, the ordinance requirements have been satisfied. The uh, consideration of the item was deferred. So um, they had the public hearing and the item was deferred. Um, people at that, at, at that meeting would have known it was the decision was deferred, as well as the uh, agenda item for the next meeting would have had that on the agenda. But uh, as far as having another public hearing, they didn't have another public hearing at that second meeting. So there would be no publication requirements, nothing put in the paper, nothing put on the website as far as having another public hearing, uh, even though they did have public comment um, to speak. In the same way, if this board had a public hearing this evening and decided to defer the item to a next meeting, we've, we've, we would have had uh, complied with and adhered to our requirement to have a public hearing at this level. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't publish another public hearing for the next meeting because you would have had that tonight. You satisfied your, your statutory and, and ordinance requirements by having that public hearing. So um, they would have had the same notice if they had the meeting, they would have had notice through the agendas, but it wasn't a public hearing at that second deferred meeting. So they, they send out in the public hearing process, you post, you post the property and, and then and, uh, initially you post the property and what you send out letters to certain Residents in the area is that the process? I'll, I'll let Miss uh, Leaf explain that, but I don't think the posting of the property. Y'all may have done that, but I'm not sure that's a requirement for a special use. I mean, the property's posted as we speak. I was there yesterday, and and uh, what I, my, you know, my question is, where that where that property is posted, uh, from my uh, observation, my question would be, how many people saw that? Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about a piece of property here that dead ends on a river, and you're talking about a piece of property here that y'all posted at the dead end. So uh, what good was the sign other than the people that own the property? How many people would have actually seen that sign? So um, if they didn't have the sign up before, and you know that would be my question. And, and we've had this happen before in other public hearing areas on alcohol license and all, and I may remember me calling that up and uh, found out that there was no sign posted. So um, I, my, my question is, I just want, I want all fairness to, to the people this is going to affect and just make sure that we follow the proper procedure and that, um, I mean, obviously there was something uh, didn't flow very well in the IPC meetings, and and that's how it ended up here tonight. Uh, if everything had flowed like it was supposed to have, then you would have, we wouldn't even be talking about this in most cases. I mean, it would have come for us for, I guess, 
if it had to, but if they had gone ahead and voted on it and, and voted it down, then, you know, I guess they had a, what, a, a process to bring it back if they wanted to. But, you know, my, my question is, is even though it's not written down as a requirement, uh, my, my question is, are we being fair to the, to the residents of the area and, and uh, you know, what's going to become of this? Um, is it is it going to get to a point? I know you have limitations up there, but is it going to get to a point where uh, they could come back and, and ask for uh, you know beer limitations or, or whatever the situation may be to expand the situation, expand the operation? Uh, it's obviously a commercial venture that that uh, these folks want to. Uh, <laughs> Uh, get into and from the way it was explained to me this started out with a one, one wedding deal and it's grown into this and and we know uh, the public knows uh, what happened to us a couple of years ago on this same type of uh, venture and uh, it cost this county a lot of time and a lot of money to get that straightened out a lot of, a lot of court time uh, when the residents really brought brought the a thumb in there and put it on these people and said, "Look, you're disturbing our subdivision. You're disturbing my my kid riding up down the street. You're disturbing this and that and the other." So that that that's what I'm saying. Even though we weren't required to have that second public hearing or required to send out that second letter or notice or however we were supposed to have have notified the the residents i'm just i'm thinking about the fairness to the people you know that that and and uh, everybody sitting at this table right here has been bombarded with the residents i've had i've had one person uh that uh, was in favor of this it contacted me via email uh, i've had a few phone calls and uh from what I understand, all those emails went to all of us. So, uh, the the public speaking here, and and that's who we represent. So that that's why I'm asking, uh, even though it's not required, you know, who who are we here for? The requirements are the are the voters. Uh, that that's my that's my deal with it, Alan. About I mean, Aaron, about the. Uh, requirements versus you know what's right thank you um stephanie um how do we figure in this event uh, because i got calls as well i think is what um, commissioner coleman is talking about about the noise of a project i know i mean unless you have an event there and um you know you have somebody standing there you won't know but uh, do we evaluate it? I mean, because we wouldn't put a nightclub right next door to, um, you know, um, somebody's home. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons because of the noise. Um, but um, so did we look at this project about as far as the noise and the, and the neighbors, um, how it might impact on the um, neighborhood? Right. Yeah, that's a very good question, and that you know, was definitely questions that came up with the IPC and by members of the public. Um, so I know some of the conditions that the applicants have suggested um, do do help mitigate that. So they they have um, let's see, I'll, yeah, pull that one up. Um, so they have. Uh, mentioned that they would end all music by 10 p.m. And um, I believe that is um, more restrictive than our noise ordinance, if I understand correctly. So that so 10 p.m. would be um, the end of music. And they've also talked about orienting um, the music away from existing residents. So you know whether it's you know, out towards the river or the marsh, so that the existing closest neighborhood residents you know don't don't hear a band um, you know uh, performing towards them during the time of an event. So um, you know and. Um, the way this project came came to us is originally started out as um, an enforcement issue. We had gotten a, a letter saying that this, these were going on in violation or potential violation of the zoning, and so we um, did investigate it and send a letter out to the owners, and they were very quick to respond and submit their application and start this process. Um, but during that time, to my knowledge, there had not been any noise complaints or complaints received by our office about the noise particularly, and they had been you know having events because it it did like Commissioner and Coleman mentioned. 
mentioned, I mean, it started out very small, a couple weddings because people were renting the homes and said, hey, we'd also like to have our, you know, our family wedding out here as well because it's such a beautiful location so it just kind of started small um, and you know they had to you know they had no understanding or knowledge that it was in violation of zoning at that time so it just kind of started and then when they were notified um, they came in and applied for the appropriate permit so um, uh, how close is the neighborhood or closest residency mm. from um, from where the events would take you let's see um. So there are um, so there are some houses in very close proximity to the event. Um, there are several properties adjacent along the water that are owned by um, by the applicants, and so they are they are really their closest neighbors. So um, the folks that are most affected um, are really properties owned by the applicants. And then there are um, uh, properties along Stevens Lane um, that are really adjacent to this property. And then the Commons neighborhood is a um, there were some. Uh, uh, people in the comments that were concerned that some of the event may take place by a horse barn that is very close to the commons, and that is not where the event would take place at all. But there are, you know, a lot of residents that would be very close to where that horse barn is located. But the events will not be at that location. Um, I cannot, yeah, I cannot tell you exactly how in terms of feet. That's the proximity. My observation was probably as the crow flies a couple hundred yards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, I was just gonna remind my fellow commissioners, this, you know, this, this is a public hearing issue, and I think we need to take a break from our discussion and move mm -hmm. into the public hearing and, and uh, hear from the citizens, so. Uh, we're moving into the public hearing. Uh, we'll have an opportunity for the commissioners and staff to discuss later if they want to. So uh, I'm going to do this different from the alcoholic beverage license. All those opposed, uh, anyone opposed to the application, uh, come up to the podium and state your name for the record. I have five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, my name is Paul Schofield. I live less than a quarter mile from this property in the Commons, um, th which is the neighborhood that directly abuts it. And um, just for your information, every single house, all roughly 175 in the Commons, are within a half mile of this property. So we are right next to it. Um, I, you know, in terms of the, uh, the notice that went out, it only went out to people within 300 feet. So I never received a notice despite being a quarter mile away. I was talking to people before this meeting in the Commons and very few of them had any notice that this was going on. No one saw the sign. Um, the way I found out about it was in the newspaper after the first IPC meeting. So there hasn't been adequate notice to our neighbors. But um, you know, to get to the heart of this matter, um, I'm respectfully requesting that you deny the special use permit for two reasons. Uh, the first is that zoning needs to mean something your constituents need to be able to rely on the existing zoning. And second, a special use permit of this type, even if you put restrictions on it, is unworkable and unenforceable. Um, to my first point, zoning ordinances are obviously in place, so you, you know not only what you can do with your property, but what your neighbors can and cannot do with theirs. Uh, people who buy property in the commons uh, buy it largely because it's a quiet, family-friendly neighborhood. It's within walking distance of Oglethorpe Point Elementary School. In fact. Um, I'd wager that there's more school, a, a higher percentage of school-aged children in this neighborhood than any other on the island, save maybe um, Harrison Point. People buy here because it's towards the north end of the island. It's away from the south end where you can expect crowds, noise, beach parties, traffic, etc. Um, and that's exactly what this wedding venue is already bringing to this area, noise, traffic, and crowds. Um, you know, what to do with this application, I think you can decide it tonight the same way you did in November with the Flint Equipment Company application for commercial rezoning. Um, because although that was a rezoning request and this is a special use permit, uh, this would effectively be a rezoning because this permit would attach to the land and allow not only this owner but any subsequent owner to conduct the same commercial activities on the land. So for all intents and purposes, this is kind of the same posture even though it's not technically the same. Um, this whole area up here was intended to be residential. There are no commercially zoned properties within roughly a mile and a half of this location. 
uh, please allow those of us in the commons and the surrounding neighborhoods have the quiet, peaceful enjoyment of their land that we were expecting when we purchased property there. Uh, make sure that current zoning means something because all of your constituents throughout the county are relying on that. And um, secondly, even if there were restrictions placed on a special use permit, um, as I stated at the Islands Planning Commission, I have personally heard this music uh, coming from this venue in my house this past summer. And I have seen signs at the end of Stevens Road where it meets Frederica directing people to this venue, which shouldn't be necessary if you're doing on off-site parking. So, and these violations were occurring after the special use permit was applied for. And um, uh, Mr. Allen, the, uh, the applicant's son, was questioned about this by the IPC commissioners. And uh, I'm gonna quote what he said. He said, it's very difficult to cancel weddings. We did have a couple while we were going through this permit pro permitting process, and I told Stephanie about it, and that we were guilty, and that we would be willing to uphold any kind of punishment that needed to be. Now, as you all know, that's not how zoning works. Owners don't get to pick and choose when to follow zoning laws and when it's not convenient for them. Um, you know, that makes business sense for them, where your job is to make people's wedding dreams come true, but it puts an extreme burden on homeowners who actually, in this case, don't have a remedy. Um, at the IPC meeting, Chairman Joel Willis asked Ms. Leaf if nearby residents would be responsible for monitoring the venue to make sure it was operating within the restrictions in terms of the number of events, time, noise, guests, etc. Her response was yes, absolutely. She stated that complaints will be made to the planning staff and investigations conducted by that staff. And, you know, I, I agree with that. We can't rely on the county police to know the ins and outs of a special use permit. But the problem with that, as you might see, is that planning staff is not going to go out there, you know, at 1030 on a Saturday night to make sure that people are parking offside, that there's no noise. You know, this is the only thing they can do is an after the fact investigation um, with no way to verify what was actually going on at the time of the violations. This would leave effective residents with no adequate remedy to address these violations. And these violations are already occurring and they're likely to continue even with these restrictions. Um, that, that's why the permit's unworkable. So just, just in summary, um, my main point here is that zoning needs to mean something. Both myself, everybody else in our neighborhood and everywhere in the county need to be able to rely on the zoning that's in place. Uh, you can't allow commercial uses to just pop up on any, right in the, any residential area, and that's really what this is. This is a residential area, and that's why people choose to live there. Please allow us and our children to enjoy our home free from noise, traffic, and nuisance that this is going to bring. I respectfully ask that you deny this application. I mean, in the alternative, at least remand this to the Island Planning Commission for further proceedings, but I respectfully request that you deny this. Thank you for your time. Uh, state your name for the record, please, sir. Are you, are you talking to me, Mike, or the prior speaker? Yes, George. Uh, George Ragsdale, uh, St. Simons. Um, I didn't attend the second one of the IPC meetings. I've listened to the tape three or four times. Uh, I did note in the minutes, or sorry, in the summary, staff summary of tonight's, for tonight's meeting, that they didn't report the fact that there were, in fact, two motions made. Uh, I, Ms. Leaf has corrected that tonight. What I'd like to do, though, is to call your attention to a couple of things in the ordinance that, at best, are confusing to me and, I think, to the other IPC members. Um, the section that's been quoted with respect to this 60-day uh, period says that um, uh, once it's been filed, the 60 days is supposed to be measured, and I'm gonna read it directly from the ordinance. The Planning Commission shall consider and take formal action on an application for a zoning decision within 60 calendar days of the date that an application is filed with the Community Development Director. Well, as Ms. Leaf said, and as the record shows, that application was filed in April. As a practical matter, uh, the application wasn't complete. The ordinance doesn't say anything about it having to be complete, but as a practical matter, it doesn't make sense that that 60 days would start to run from the time they submit the application if it's not complete. So the question becomes, when is, in fact, the application complete? When we were first presented with this at the October 15th uh, IPC meeting, uh, it had been assumed, and the reason it had been put on the agenda at all was it had been assumed that the, the, the uh, uh, septic permit would have been approved and issued prior to that meeting. It was not. Now you can argue whether that means that the application was complete or not, but in fact, we at that meeting deferred it because in our opinion that was not complete because there was not the report from the engineer that said that the thing qualified for septic. So 
I would argue that at the very least, the 60-day uh, um, period should not have run until the application was complete. Uh, when we had the meeting on the October 15th and again on November uh, 19th, one of the things that was requested was a sketch that would show specifically those areas that were the subject of this application. As you read the, uh, um, the agenda item tonight, Commissioner Browning, you said it was for 425 and 300. In fact, they want it to be only for 300 uh, Stevens Road. 300 Stevens Road is not delineated on the application in terms of that area that this would apply to. We asked for a drawing to be submitted that would, it would delineate the area that this would apply to. That drawing's never been submitted. It's supposed to be a dimension drawing. The hand sketch that's in your packet doesn't rise to that level. One of the requirements of the zoning ordinance for a special use permit is that there are 15 items that have to be submitted. It says they shall be submitted. It doesn't say it's discretionary. It says they shall be submitted. One of those items is this dimension drawing, which to date has never been submitted. So one could argue that the application even today has never been completed, meaning that the 60-day clock in theory has not yet started to run. The reason the IPC could not come to any consensus uh, or to a, a re recommendation for approval or denial was a lot of, had a lot to do with the fact that we wanted to make sure that the conditions that were being suggested and agreed to were in fact enforceable. We never got to finish that discussion. Uh, as Commissioner Brunson said, at the end of the day, this is your decision. But what's different from what would normally happen, I would hope, is that the IPC would be making a recommendation to you with conditions that we had spent four hours talking about, and those conditions would be part of that recommendation. This is coming to you tonight for your decision without that recommendation, either from the IPC with respect to approval or denial, or with respect to those conditions. One last thing I would like to point out, and this has not been discussed by anyone tonight, and that is the report from uh, Mr. Rigdon, who was the soil scientist that did the uh, uh, testing on the site. Uh, and I'm gonna quote. Um, what he said was, um, the suitability grade, first of all, the suitability grade assigned by Mr. Rigdon, who was the soil scientist, was a C plus. That report is in your packet. A C rating is, is defined as follows. Due to water table flooding and or drainage problems, there's a high probability of failure for conventional septic systems. So this septic system is located right next to the marsh. Although the septic permit was issued, it was evaluated by the, the uh, engineer who issued that permit by saying that there was a high probability of failure for conventional systems, implying that something other than conventional system really should have been what was uh, uh, applied here. That's my biggest concern with the approval. I would respectfully suggest that you remand this back to the Planning Commission because the 60-day calendar, the 60-day clock, excuse me, under the ordinances as written, technically hasn't run. One last thing, um, and I don't know where I am with my five minutes, but one last thing. Um, it, it was said at the, um, at the November 19th meeting, it was not suggested that a deferral was an option for the Planning Commission. In my opinion, there's a conflicting set of statements in the ordinance. The ordinance defines a formal action as being either approval or denial. It says that a deferral is not a formal action in one section of the ordinance. But in another section of the ordinance, it specifically says that the Planning Commission can defer and that that deferral is considered to be a formal action. It needs to be reconciled. If deferral were a formal action, that was not suggested or discussed as an alternative for the Planning Commission on the 19th. That's the reason that the vote ended up 3-2. I believe if deferral had been an option, it would have been deferred. Thank you. Speaker, <coughs> Julian Smith, St. Simons Island. I attended both those meetings of the IPC, and the IPC worked valiantly to try to come to some kind of resolution and could not. Um, the IPC chair should have left the public hearing open once they knew that they could not get to a vote. It, they, he could have then reopened the public hearing and instead of inviting people to come up, left it open till the next meeting and at the next meeting, 
the applicant came with statements and evidence, uh, et, et cetera, that uh, in, in effect uh, made a formal public hearing necessary. Um, now, the, uh, there's a real problem for the IPC in terms of getting the number of votes they need, four positive votes or four negative votes. And that is sometimes members are absent, uh, sometimes members have to recuse themselves. There are, uh, for instance, uh, two developers on the IPC, at least two developers on the IPC, and one attorney who sometimes represents clients and, and must re recuse herself. Uh, it's clear that the IPC needs to have alternates. You need to appoint alternates. Now, that's quite separate uh, from the problems with this application. So let me get to that as quickly as I can. Um, Ms. Leaf referred about half a dozen times this evening to uh, the bathrooms. There are no bathrooms. I complained about the reference in the staff report to bathrooms. There was a privy, uh, a, a two-hole privy. Uh, uh, that's not a bathroom. Uh, what she needed to say was that the applicants have agreed to and maybe have installed two toilet rooms. Uh, it's not clear whether these toilet rooms have lavatories in them. They are not bathrooms. You cannot take a shower um, in these places. And if I'm wrong, I, I need to be uh, corrected. There are beaucoup problems, many problems with the staff report. And I wish you would have an, someone from another county uh, review and analyze this staff report for its lack of completeness, for its vagueness. Um, for instance, um, they're missing words. Uh, and we're told in standard of evaluation number one on page two that uh, guests of the event are required to park off site and shuttle onto the property, be brought on by shuttle. But can they shuffle? Can they walk down the road? Can they come by bike, um, et cetera? Um, we're, we're, we're told uh, about the location of off-street parking. Vehicles on the site are limited. No, the amount of parking is limited for vehicles. Or there's going to be a limitation on the number of vehicles that can come onto the property. Um, we're told in number three about the signs. Um, we're not told how many signs there are and how large they are. We're told what we already know, that signage on St. Simon's Island is limited to 24 square feet in size. We're not told how many signs there are, uh, these so-called small directional signs. Are these small directional signs visual litter uh, along uh, the, the, the various roads? We're told in item six, the hours and manner of operation. Um, okay, we're told that the events end by 10 p.m. The applicant states that most events tend to be afternoon, evening events ending before 10 p.m. If most end before 10, 10 p.m., that implies that some do not end before 10 p.m. Miss Leaf told you that the music would stop at 10 p.m. An event is not over when the music stops. The event is over when the people have got into the buses, have stopped talking and yakking and laughing and clapping or whatever they're doing. Um, we need to know when and how the events will end. Um, we are told uh, about lighting. Uh, lighting will be brought on. How much lighting? Floodlights like a Hollywood premiere? How much light? Uh, where will it be directed, um, et cetera. And you, you can go through this and you'll find uh, uh, similar problems. Um, okay, um, this is not good. Uh, it wasn't good in October, the staff report. It wasn't good in November. And it's a shame that I have to come up here and tell you this is a poorly written, illogical, incomplete, imprecise, and in some cases, even contradictory staff report. You need better work by your staff. 
they're nice people, but they need some firm direction. And you may have to hire someone to help them edit these staff reports, to ask them questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. <clears throat> Jeff Kilgore, um, and I have been before you uh, a number of times to plead with you to enforce your ordinances. And that's why I'm here again tonight. Now, I'm going to be a little bit measured in my comments. Um, Unlike me. Most people don't like to use pejoratives. Uh, and so what I'll say is, uh, in public speaking anyway, they don't. Um, so what I'm going to say is there are prevaricators that work for this county. Um, I have uh, spent a good deal of time trying to get the documents um, to uh, back up what has happened here. And um, the gentleman who spoke earlier was very eloquent. Um, uh, uh, in terms of the protect protection of property owners and their property rights. I've spoken about that at the IPC both times that this was there. Now, I don't know which section of your ordinance that your county attorney refers to and reads from, but section 1105 is uh, as clear as it can be. Uh, a special use permit is a zoning change in the state of Georgia, and it is in this county. The um, fact is that um, this is a zoning change, and it, and it was on October the 15th. The application, there was a motion, uh, and the application was deferred. Stephanie Leaf stood here and told you that the public comment period was closed. Well, I've got all this correspondence from your staff people that say the public comment period was not closed. And that, uh, indeed, uh, the public comment period does not need to be noticed because it was continued because it was deferred. Well, they're wrong, and your attorney is wrong. The, applicant, the application was deferred. Now, your ordinance, section 1105.2, is very clear. about zoning changes, and it says prior to any public hearing at which the application will be considered, uh, it requires um, 15 days notice in the county organ, published notice, so that the surrounding residents will know what's going to happen and what's going to affect their property. If you'll view the video, of the November 20th or 19th, uh, November 19th meeting, Chairman Joe Willis very clearly said it was a public hearing. So now, I don't know how these people come up here tonight and tell you that it was not a public hearing because it clearly was. Um, but what's most important is that those property owners that surround this property deserved an opportunity to be there and to have this application studied and uh, for the uh, conditions to be articulated by the Island Planning Commission and, and incorporated in whatever permit you might deem appropriate and, and approve. The gentleman earlier spoke about enforcement and, and how are those residents supposed to rely on any enforcement uh, with this uh, event venue going on right next door to them. Mr. Brunson clearly said this is a zoning change. Your ordinance requires a public hearing when a zoning change is decided and to be made. There's an easy solution here. Um, just to remand this back to the IPC so that it could be handled properly. As Mr. Ragsdale has said, the 60 days, in my opinion, has not begun to run. I, I've got the um, correspondence here from the applicant. In your ordinance, there is no 
expiration on that applicant's request for the application to be extended, for the time of review to be extended. Statutorily, you can't tell me anywhere in the ordinance. So now your county attorney, when he says that that's expired, okay, fine, show it to me. Where's it expired? Um, Mr. Ragsdale went through the, the timeline. Uh, if you, if you protect the property owners, if you exist for any purpose at all, if you uh, view yourselves to be elected by the people who own the property, who invest and live in these houses, then you must send this back at a minimum for the proper consideration of the IPC and the protection of the property owners. Now, if you wanna choose to deny it tonight, that's your call, but at a minimum, please, give these people a right that they're entitled to. Send it back to the IPC, and I appreciate you allowing me the time to go over, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, uh, anyone else want to get up and speak in opposition? Uh, come to the podium and state your name, please. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is John Haley, a retired Lieutenant Colonel, Georgia Air National Guard, Squadron Commander here in Brunswick. I live on West Commons Drive, sir, and you just, you gentlemen just need to know that uh, with the windows down in my home and the doors closed, when they play the music, it comes right through the house. Okay? I just want you guys to know that when you make your consideration. Uh, if, if it was me and I was voting, I would deny it. Okay? Thank you, gentlemen. Do we have anyone else want to come up to the podium and speak in opposition? Anyone else? Okay, we're gonna move on to um, anyone in favor uh, may come up to the podium and speak. State your name for the record, please, sir. Hi, my name is Mason Waters, and I live at 217 Stevens Road. I bordered this property. I've shared a border with it for on coming on 15 years now. Um, in, in fact, I th oh, you'll see that the rest of the bordering neighbors are also here tonight. And um, I, I would like to say just out of the get-go, just so you know where I'm coming from, that I'm in favor of this. In fact, I fully support it and appreciate it. And I'm going to tell you why I appreciate it. Um, right before the downturn in the economy, this property went under foreclosure with SunTrust Bank. During the time it was under foreclosure, I had the opportunity to look at the plans of a local developer come across my desk at the bank I work at, where uh, they were going to carve this property up into 36 lots and build houses on it. Well, during that time, that developer couldn't come up with the money, and the Allens bought this property. And the first thing they told me is, we have no intention of subdividing this property. We have no intention of trying to pack and create as high density as we possibly can. In fact, we love it like it is. We want to preserve it like it is. And they have been excellent stewards of this property ever since they've owned it. So a few years ago, they did decide that they wanted to share the beauty of this property with others, and they did start having some events out there. I can tell you that the only people that are closer to this, to where the events occur, are the Langfords and the Jacobs, who are here tonight. And I've never found it to be a nuisance. Can I hear the music? Every once in a while every once in a while, but it's never been a problem. It's never gone late enough to where I thought to myself, I need to call and see if this is breaking an ordinance. It's been just fine. Um, and, I, and quite frankly, I would much rather have 12 events a year on this property than for one day it to go in somebody's um, hands and say, you know, there's just no reason for me to sit here and pay the property taxes on this big piece of property without benefiting from it. I'm going to sell it off to somebody who's going to carve it up and they're going to wrap the commons on around and put as many houses as they possibly can on it. So I'm here to say I'm in favor. I do not find it a nuisance. I've never looked out of my front door and I live on Stevens Road and thought to myself, wow, that's way too many cars. In fact, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a rare occasion that I look out there and even see the trolley go by. So these are good folks. They're doing good things with the land. I'm happy they are and I fully support it. So thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm uh, Russell Jacobs, uh, I'm the other neighbor, and we've lived back there uh, about eight, almost eight years, and uh, would I rather not have anything else back there? Uh, no, but if I'm going to have to have something, what I would rather have what they're talking about doing, 
uh, doing it. I'm like Mason. I've not. I've seen the trolley a few times. Uh, the worst thing that's happened is uh, occasionally I have found my trash can because we share a trash can area uh, full of boxes, but. I've used theirs before too. So, and uh, Jimmy over there, who's their property manager, rolls them out, and we put them back. So, um, you know, profit, private property rights works both ways. Uh, when that property went into foreclosure with SunTrust, anybody could have bought that. And there's developers on the island uh, who would have put as much density as they could back there. So, what we'd be talking about not wanting could be a lot worse. And you know. That's the way I see it. I mean, and the Allens keep it clean. If we, I mean, it's like a marriage. It's not always perfect, but when something happens, we hash it out and we move on. And uh, I understand that you don't want to hear the music, uh, but it does stop at 10 o'clock. And I disagree that when the music stops, people do go home because I've seen it at my own parties. Um, so, and I, I just think that if I want to have a party or do something at my own property, I want the right to do that. So I'm not going to tell them they can't do it if I want to be able to do it at some point as well. So uh, I don't say I'm as gung-ho for it as Mason, but but if you're going to have something, this is much better than many other things that could be back there. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir. Anyone else want to come up to the podium? <clears throat> Hello, my name is Tammy Langford. My husband is Jimmy Langford, and we are neighbors of the Allens. My grandparents were Benjamin K. Stevens and Marion Stevens. My grandfather's family were the original owners of this property before the Allens. My mother and I used to live in what is now known as the boat house with my grandparents when I was a child. My aunt and uncle, Mary and Bobby Stubbs, lived on both pieces of the property over the course of their lives, otherwise known as the bluff and the boathouse. Jimmy and I now live in the A-frame behind the boathouse that my grandmother built after my grandfather passed away. I grew up on this property. Our family used to ride horses through what is now known as the commons, before the commons was ever even there. My grandfather, Ben Stevens, built me a tree house in one of the oak trees when I was around five years old. I am now 60 years old, and that tree is still there. No one other than my family and the Allens, Mason, and Russell could love this property and have as many memories on this property as I do. The Allens restored both houses as close to their original state as possible and have put up several bluebird houses, bird feeders. We have hummingbirds on the property. You need to come out there and look at it. It's like a Garden of Eden. They maintain the preservation of the wildlife and the beauty of the property. There is a herd of about 13 or more deer that come through our property every morning and evening. I gave the Allens a copy of the Stevens genealogy records that my uncle Harry Parker put together with the history of the property. Mr. Phil was so happy to read that. He made books for each of the houses, the rental properties, for the guests to read. All of this information is also on the Captain's Bluff website. The Allens say that their guests always comment on how peaceful the property is, how much they enjoy watching the wildlife, the beautiful sunsets, and reading about the history of the properties, my family. I feel that my grandparents would be very happy with how the Allens have restored and maintained the properties. If a developer had purchased this property, there would be a phase two of the commons. Can you imagine the number of cars that could have been coming up and down that road daily if that had happened. We have a hard time even getting home on Halloween. There's cars all down that road. But do I complain about that? No, I go home. We should all be counting our blessings and be thankful that the Allens were the ones to purchase this property. Jimmy and I are agreeable with the Allens allowing weddings each month to offset the cost of what they have spent restoring this property. We are the closest house to the venue and we are voting for this. We are, it's not a problem for us. Thank you. Well, thank you, ma'am. Uh, anyone else want to get up and speak in favor? Uh, anyone else? Uh, yes, please come up. Hello, my name is Deborah Haley. I'm Mrs. Haley. 
um, and I've lived in the commons for 21 years. I flipped off, flopped on this issue three times. Uh, I was just ma recently made aware of this issue only thanks to Mr. Schofield, my neighbor. Um, I have heard the music. Uh, I've not found it intrusive. I was curious about where it was coming from and how they were able to do it in that setting, knowing the zoning. My I've also pulled a couple of my neighbors just in the last 12 hours who are closer to that area and asked um, if it was a nuisance to them. The ones I was able to get in touch with said it was not a nuisance to them, but their children are also away at college. I've had a lot of problems in that neighborhood on and off when my children were younger with noise problems, but that was just from other neighbors. My concern for this is if there were a way to have this be an exception, I support this family and their efforts. Um, I'm friends with Mr. Graham, who goes to church with Mr. Allen, and he originally convinced me that it, if it, uh, that it was a you know, good option, um, better than carving it up into 30 or 45 lots, which would mean years of construction noise, people driving up and down that way who've been drinking while constructing, all the things that I experienced when we built our house in the uh, second phase of the commons. Um, if there were a way to make this an exception to the zoning or only while it was under the hands of the Allens, um, I would be up for that. Uh, but if this is, would be a permanent zoning problem or issue, that what's to uh, ensure that after the Allens um, are no longer in possession of this property, that someone else might do something worse with it, something louder, noisier, and more disruptive. If there were a way to ensure that that couldn't happen, I think 12 times a year is fine. Um, I've never heard the music go late past 10 o'clock. Kind of wish I'd been invited. Um, and it is a beautiful area, and uh, so, but that's up to y'all's judgment as to, and your experience in the law and zoning issues. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Pardon me. <clears throat> Anyone else want to come up and speak in favor? <clears throat> okay, we're going to close the public comment. Uh, commissioners, um, open for discussion. Mr. Commissioner, I would, I'd like, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, comment again. Um, there have been several points and facts laid out here. Uh, and you, you got to go back to what I was saying before. You, there, there, in my, in my opinion, there's there's way too many unanswered questions here, um, and and how this thing came from the IPC to us. Um, I I have, um, um, I ju I just feel like that we need to uh, listen to what's been said here tonight, uh, especially by Mr. Ragsdale being a member of the IPC and putting the facts on the table and, and telling it like it is. Um, I know there's a lot of um, emotion going on here, uh, a lot of personal feelings, but uh, it's, I think it's our job to make sure that we follow, follow our code and ordinances to the T, uh, regardless how minor some of them may be and I think that uh, for all practical purposes this needs to be uh, remanded back to the Planning Commission and I'd like to make that in the form of a motion. Okay, Commissioners, we have a motion <clears throat> on the floor. Mr. Chairman, um, because I want to continue this discussion, I will give that motion a second. Um, I, and I have just a, a, a few more questions, um, if I could, please. Sure. Uh, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, any further discussion? <laughs> I thought we were going to vote on that motion. Uh, <laughs> Stephanie, if I, if I could, uh, this special use permit, uh, we're, we're changing the zoning. What is the special use zoning called for, for this? 
So the, um, the zoning itself does not change. So the underlying zoning is still forest agricultural and conservation preservation, but the forest agricultural part of the property is the only place where the events will take place and they will have a special use permit that'll run with this property. So, as, so if the applicants were to sell the property, the special use permit would still be valid as long as the new owners um, adhere to this exact plan and any conditions, anything else that's added. So it does run with the land but they have to do exactly what they have proposed. If they were to change it, you know, build a building, have more events per year, they would have to come back to the IPC and this body to amend their special use permit to change that. This is a zoning request. Is the zoning change then just to add the special use to the existing Zoning is that is that's how it's that's how it's called that's what it's how it's labeled. There's no and and, and my question is it, is this a commercial input to, as the special use? So, um, so it, in the forest agricultural zoning district, you know, there's different layers of uses. There's, you know, permitted, um, then there is, you know, special and conditional uses that are allowed. And under the list of sp special uses that can be applied for if you have an FA zone property is a place of public assembly. And that's what we have this under as an event. So the zoning stays the same. Um, basically in terms of um, the way we do public hearing notices and process an application, whether you're gonna rezone the property or you're gonna be applying for a conditional or special use, it's really handled through the same state laws and, and our county attorney can, can add to that. Um, so we, we do handle it like a zoning change, but specifically the zoning will stay the same, but what they're adding is a special use. So, and so that, a special, and use, that special use is not called a special commercial use. Correct, it's just called a special use, okay. and it's a special use permit for a place of public assembly, which is specifically in the FA zoning as a, as a special use. And in relation then, moving on from that, in relation to a public hearing, this is a public hearing for the purpose of hearing this rezone request, right? I mean, uh, to, to refer it back to the IPC still would require that it comes back to this board for approval, is that right? That is correct, yeah. To remand okay. it back to the IPC, they would consider it, but it would still be a recommendation to the to the Board of Commissioners, so you will still see it again if it went back if, to the if IPC. If it went back, okay. And, correct. And I appreciate that clarification. Sure. Uh, I, think, I think that's all I have for right now, thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> if it comes back to us, do we have another public hearing? I will defer to the county attorney on that. The commissioners, I, I would recommend you have another public hearing at that point. Well, what? I don't understand. I, Why did, I mean, you said that there was not, we've had two, but only required one for the IPC, but I, I think it, two for us. I think at that point it'd be cleaner. We, you know, I guess depending on what the recommendation is um, from the IPC, uh, how it, it may change. Um, you know, I think it may be debatable whether you have to have another one. But going back through that process, I would recommend that another one be held just to, you know, out of abundance of caution. I hope I live long enough to never see another forest agricultural zoning in Glen County. It is absolutely the most egregious zoning in this county. Uh, Ms. Leaf, I know that um, the Allens uh, could put them a salvage yard out there. I know they could put them a pig farm out there. I know they could put them a chicken farm out there with probably three or 4,000 chickens. Um, Tell me what they could do without going through anything but a building permit process if they, had an, if they were going to do expedited subdivision in that 18 acres. Um, how many um, houses could they build out there without asking us for anything? 
without asking you all for anything. So expedited subdivision would be would be an administrative process from start to finish, right. and they could do up to four lots, and that would just go through our community development um, and other county departments. It, that would yeah, I understand that, but how many s expedited subdivision? could they put in there on that amount and just four lots is that right. i know that's four lots but then it's, they could do another one yeah i mean what we say with expedited subdivision is it's a one-time division of a tract so what does happen though is that um maybe a large piece of property for very large tracts maybe a large piece is left as kind of undeveloped land it doesn't actually get divided into a lot and so you may see other four four lot expedited subdivisions kind of pop up when you right. do have a large tract that's so. my point Right. But if they went through preliminary and final plat, which of course final plat would come before the board, um, then they could do you know more lots at one time. Did I leave out anything horrible that they could put in there? Uh, surface mining? Surface you mining. That's right. I, I knew there was something else. Maybe surface mining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We <laughs> yeah, could do a bar pit in there. Yeah. Okay. So there's, and there's with dump trucks and all uses. that sort of stuff. Okay, good. Thank you. Stephanie, under the future land use map this is listed as correct me if i'm wrong uh, coastal marsh is that correct is that the character area that is correct and under coastal marsh there are certain zonings that can be and that are permitted is that correct correct can you tell us exactly what those zonings are mm -hmm. sure so on so the coastal marshlands is you know as you said a character area it's a future land use designation um, in our comprehensive plan and um and there are several um, higher density zoning districts that would be permitted. Now the applicant would of course still have to go through a rezone process, but um, resort residential, um, general residential, which all, you know, resort residential allows, you know, hotels and townhomes and multifamily and condos. Um, I mean, that is actually a permitted zone um, in coastal marshland. So they would apply for a rezone to do so, but they would not have to amend the future land use map to do something like that, and, so. And we developed the comprehensive plan correct to, to kind of give us some guidance is that correct and so the guidance in this area is uh yes forest agriculture but you could put a bunch of townhomes or there it could come before this commission or a future commission which the the makeup might be different um and that um, you could put higher density in there than what's currently there correct yeah, that, that's definitely a possibility. Someone could apply to, to do that, and um, it would fit the future land use map as the comp plan has I adopted. mean, I think we had discussed that we thought that maybe as many as 34, 36 homes could right. be put in that area uh, under that scenario. Um, if you look at two cars per home, five trips a day, you know, that's another 400 cars that are going up and down that road on a daily basis during peak times. Typically are these events that they, they have, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, they're usually on a Saturday or Sunday, is that right? That's my understanding, yes. So on off peak times on the roads, is that correct? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you, I think Mr. Mason talked about, I, I don't know sure if you were here at the time, but did anyone, um, see some of the plans besides Mr. Mason that of what what developers were trying to put out there at one time or do you have any knowledge of it? I, I do not have any knowledge. That was before I was with the county, so I do not have any knowledge of that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And Stephanie to to go back to this, I I am in favor of, of them being able to have this venue and I think it's it's a, a, a less dense use of the property I, I, I applaud the preservation process my problem is totally in the process and mm -hmm. and what our attorney said uh, to commissioner brunson just a minute ago that if we deferred this and it came back up that he'd recommend another public hearing i i don't see how that reconciles with the fact that we didn't have another public hearing uh during the ipc and and i'm i'm troubled with the process uh I, I am not fighting the end result, uh, uh, so uh, I, I, I'm confused by the process that that brought us to where we are, and and I I want to make sure that we get that clear and get it right. Okay. Any more discussion, commissioners? <clears throat> All right. I'm going to call the vote. We have a motion to remand back to IPC and a second. All those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. Right hand. Okay, those opposed, same. All right, four to two, that motion fails. Uh, commissioner's back in your lap. 
Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the special use permit uh, for um, 300 Stevens Lane <coughs> as presented to us by the staff. Do you want to include those? Uh, um, I thought those would be included. Is that correct? I, I, they, I didn't Mr. See Attorney, that. do I need to state that? Yes, sir. Okay, we'd like to approve the special use permit as um, for 300 Stevens Lanes with the conditions that were out that are currently outlined in our packet. I'm not going to read each one of those, but those are the conditions um, that that it would be approved with. Second. Commission, we have a motion to second. Um, any further discussion? If I can just uh, clarify, um, in the packet, the list of conditions that were in your packet were actually what was directly submitted from the applicant. Um, the conditions that are on the screen um, were, were staff staff's conditions based on what the applicant submitted and some of the comments from IPC. So if I could just clarify if you want um, the ones on the screen right now or whether it's um, the ones that were submitted by the applicant that were in your packet, which is this list right here on the screen. I mean, those are the same, is that correct? Just different wording? They are largely the same. There's a few conditions from that the applicant submitted that I don't think the county really would have a, con, you know, would be need to be concerned with. So they were, they're just not something that the county maybe would worry about as much. So, um, so there's some additional conditions on here um, <coughs> that I wouldn't necessarily recommend, but I don't believe they hurt by having them on there. Such as? Uh, so I know there's uh, number six is a list of vendors uh, must be provided to Captain's Bluff staff before last payment is made. This will ensure that all vendors are aware of our requirements and no issues the day of event. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily, you know, necessary, but it's more of a, you know, heads up that anyone who's on the property understands the conditions of the special use permits. So I don't think it hurts by having that on there. Okay, my, my motion would be to use the applicant's um, um, proposals for conditions okay thank you very much for clarifying I, that i second again okay uh motion and a second clarified and uh any further discussion okay i call the question well, let me let me just interject one more thing uh, mr chairman we'll get on with it uh while i do believe that this is a good venue uh i would have preferred that it go back to uh, ipc for clarification but uh in the uh, event that that has failed, um, you know, I, I am in support of their venue, just just not the process. So I'm ready to vote with you. Uh, Commissioner Hill's ready to vote. So commissioners, uh, all those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. Those opposed, same. All right, it's five to one. Motion passes. Mr. Graham, you got it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, move to approve consent agenda general business. Uh, I think that's all we got on consent agenda with the exception of any item that a commissioner might wish to uh, pull for discussion. Second. Have a motion and a second on consent agenda. I have a motion and a second on consent agenda. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> All those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, general business. <clears throat> Item 16, consider awarding a contract for the Demery Road East Beach Causeway Roundabout Project to Riverstone Construction, LLC of Jacksonville, Florida, in the amount of $1,713,513.96. We with funding to be provided by SPLOS 2016 and the general fund fund balance. Mr. Austin. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to be up here uh, and bring this to you before the commission. Uh, as opposed to having to bring it through finance and then the commission. Uh, we're, we're, at, we're at a time schedule where we'd like to get this awarded and like to get moving on it. We had originally uh, planned for this to be the, the third intersection improvement, but we had a, a challenge with the second one. And so uh, that one stalled and uh, we uh, worked to get this one up to the front. Uh, so let me quickly brief you on this. 
Uh, you might remember this, the Pond study, April uh, 2016, recommendation of uh, the roundabout here at uh, Demery and East Beach, verified by our uh, uh, county uh, traffic engineer, Ben Pierce, and uh, the estimate down there, the 2015-2014 estimate down there. Uh, so uh, BOC approved, you might have remembered a work session where we approved to go forward on the design of these roundabouts and we uh, moved out uh, uh, on, a, on a wide front to design all of them at the same time. So uh, well, AMC designed both the roundabouts on either side of each beach. Uh, we, uh, this one uh, presented some challenges because uh, there's existing water and sewer, uh, sewer lines and water lines uh, in this area and we worked uh, diligently with uh, Todd, uh, uh, Klein. 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 that's right, and Andrew back there and uh, to, uh, to design that part and uh, and we are, and, and actually they approved, I'll show you here in a minute, they approved some money for the project. Uh, but uh, and then we put it out for bid in December and we got uh, three bids, these three bids here. And you'll notice that, uh, you know, uh, less than $80,000 between the low bid and the high bid. So this is a little bit of an eye chart here. Okay, so this is how the money runs and works out on this. Uh, the 1.713 million uh, is the low bid from Riverstone Construction out of Jacksonville. Uh, we don't have a history with Riverstone Construction out of Jacksonville. However, uh, we did call, we spent some time calling references and found out that they've done some good work down there. Uh, 50,000 above them was uh, uh, seaboard construction and curb and gutter, which just completed the roundabout at East Beach and Ocean, uh, was the uh, the highest bidder. <clears throat> so we have uh, so we've we've scraped some money out of some of our other projects. You know, occasionally we do a uh, SPOS project and it does come in under budget. Uh, so uh, the other, uh, Ocean East Beach was under budget. Uh, we uh, put that money in the pot here. Ocean uh, Mallory Street uh, improvement, that's under budget, so we've taken some money out of that project. The Joint Water and Sewer Contribution, uh, 100000 uh, they voted to uh, contribute $100,000, and that's basically for upgrading the lines that we're going to uh, run into. So when we relocate a line because the road's moving or we need that area, uh, uh, for a sewer, uh, for a storm drain line, but that's on the county. When, uh, uh, when in the process of relocating that line, it may be an eight-inch line, and Joint Water and Sewer says, "Well, you know, I'd really like to have a 12-inch line there." So the county's paying for the eight-inch relocation, and the additional four-inch larger pipe is uh, uh, is being paid for by Joint Water and Sewer. And there's some calculus that goes into that to figure out exactly what that cost is, and we rounded it down to $100,000. Uh, we actually had the uh, engineer tell us uh, those numbers. And so we've taken some money out of our resurfacing uh, budget because uh, there is quite a bit of resurfacing, some sidewalk money uh, that we, uh, we save from uh, doing the 341 sidewalk under budget, and some drainage uh, money that we, when we did the North uh, Harrington outfall, uh, we did that under, under budget. So I have uh, of SWAS money 1.625 left. So I, I'd like to tap into the uh, the uh, Glenn County General Fund fund balance, of which you have, uh, you were briefed on that uh, earlier today. Uh, gosh, it seems like yesterday, but you were briefed on it earlier this evening. Uh, and so uh, for about $87,000. <laughs> so this is the project. That's another eye chart for you. I can uh, definitely uh, send that to you, but it's a, a three-phase roundabout, improved pedestrian crossings. Uh, this is just these, high, these, uh, these crude highlights that I did on this uh, uh, give you an idea of the joint water and sewer uh, work that's to be done on the roundabout. 
And so I guess your question is going to be, well, how are you going to do all that? And you know, we're going to get to that. Uh, I think I think. And so I do have that. Oh, I, so uh, so there's, you know, just like with any construction project on the island, there will be some challenges and some uh, discomfort <laughs> had by all probably. But this is uh, what we're going to try to do is uh, keep uh, this, uh, this is the maintenance of traffic. So what we're going to try to do is work in this red area on this side and keep the traffic flowing on this side and, and down to East Beach. Uh, and uh, then we'll shift and knock out this side. And then at certain times, uh, this area here to the south, the, this here area at East Beach is going to just be closed. And they'll go down to Arnold Road, detour around to Arnold Road. So, our estimated time of construction is four months, but, you know, I can tell uh, Commissioner O'Quinn, and he'll remember that when we're doing utilities uh, underground, uh, we can expect material delays. The box was not made right, the storm box was not made right, it took another week for that to come in. So uh, there are going to be some long, uh, there are going to be some lead times. <laughs> Uh, and of course, there will be, and yeah, this is no D there, an inconvenience. Uh, there will be times when the intersection will be closed. This is when we will be uh, 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 getting uh, the max pain effect right there when it's closed. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons we wanted to try and do the other intersection first, is to alleviate uh, some of the traffic around that uh, part of the island, because we know what a crucial artery this is. Uh, on the on the island, <clears throat> uh, utility interruptions, right, Andrew? Utility interruptions are going to be done at night. So, as he did, uh, Joint Water and Sewer did an excellent job in our village uh, project uh, when they did the water connections and that kind of stuff. They did those at night. So here's the motion. Uh, we have two other things that. Uh, need to be done before, but we want to uh, get a jump on the contract. We want to get this to purchasing so that you can start working the, the, uh, the contract. Uh, and we, I'm, uh, hope to be before you at the next, or have this on the next uh, board agenda meeting to finalize the MOU with Joint Water and Sewer and the right-of-way acquisition. We have about a 700 square foot right-of-way acquisition with the island townhouses, and I think we've got that just about nailed down. So that is uh, that's what I've got for you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, commissioners, any questions to Dave? Okay. Um, any discussion or a motion? What do you want to do? Mr. Chairman, I move the Board of Commissioners award a contract for Demery Road East Beach Causeway Roundabout Project to Riverstone Construction, LLC of Jacksonville, amount of one million seven thirteen five thirteen ninety six, with funding provided by SPA 16 and general fund balance contingent upon approval of memorandum of understanding with joint water and sewer and right-of-way acquisition of island townhouses. Second. Second. Motion second. Any further discussion? Uh, call the vote. All those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. Those opposed, same. Motion passes five to one. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you, Director. <clears throat> Item 17, consider approval of an environmental services agreement between the Brunswick Glen County Water Joint Water and Sewer Commission in Glen County regarding a $15 million environmental finance authority known as GIFA, loan to the JWSC. Uh, we, we want to get Mr. Andrews up here and talk about that. Okay, Mr. Burroughs, we hate to see you come up here and not get to talk. So uh, as, as Mr. Andrew Burroughs comes up, I think he was in here in previous meeting in the recent past and uh, he had uh, just become the new director of Joint Water and Sewer. So for you all that are here tonight and anybody tuning in um, outside the room, um, you know, this is our new uh, director and I want to recognize him. I failed to do that last meeting and we got caught up in some things, but Andrew's a remarkable young man. I call him young, a lot younger than I am. 
and uh, I think it's well suited for much. yeah <laughs> but I, I I have great confidence in Andrew I knew him when I was on the water and sewer board and uh, so I think uh, we're in good hands over there with him and his leadership so Andrew you got the floor buddy thank you commissioner for the kind words thank you all for the opportunity to come forward tonight the loan we're requesting through GFA will allow us to rehab the Academy Creek uh, waste water treatment plant on Newcastle as well as do some sewer line rehabilitation work doing uh, trenchless rehab throughout the county in areas we found during our smoke testing projects and if money is remaining we'll also use some of that money to rehab the Dunbar Creek wastewater plant on the island the major source of this will go to the Academy Creek project we had a SPLOST 5 project that was transferred to us by the county that funded the engineering for that work and that is currently underway the engineering is due back the early April with the su uh, suggested time for bidding in June and hopefully we'll begin construction in September if this loan is approved. We will be rehabbing the odor control facilities at Academy Creek so when you drive through there you don't notice a smell. We're going to be doing some internal piping rehabs and we're also going to be adding filters on the back side of the plant that will help clean up the water even more than what is required by our permits. And the, again, the CIPP work, the cured in place pipe work that will be done will be done based off of the information we found on St. Simons and on the mainland in recent smoke testing projects that will help stabilize those pipes so we don't have any more sinkholes in those areas. The agreement before you tonight essentially is the county, and Aaron help me with this if I'm misstating this, the county is agreeing to basically uh, backstop the loan in the event we decide not to pay this, which I can assure you will not happen. We have this budgeted already for this year's budget, even though the loan hasn't hit yet, and we will be making the payments going forward. We actually have money in our reserves to pay the entire loan balance off at any time, but we'd rather keep the $15 million and pay it along the way. Well, Andrew, we're, uh, I see where you've got a $560,000 uh, debt service that's going to go away in July, but uh, you say backstop, which means we're guaranteeing this loan, and you seem pretty sure you can pay it back. Yes, sir. You the maximum what? loan payback will be about $700,000, and since we've got about six hundred coming off, not a big uh, imposition on us. Well, I, I mean, you know, usually you make a collateralized loan, and I don't know what the collateral is here, but I, I just remember the first loan I ever made, Mr. Harris told me, son, before I lose the first dollar, you're going to lose your last. And uh, so uh, with that in mind, I just want to make sure that uh, the mayor has assured me that the city is going to, this is jointly and severally, you know, we're going to be jointly and severally liable, uh, Mr. County Attorney. Um, so it's a lot of money. It is a lot of money, yes, sir, but it is needed money to move the infrastructure forward. Um, uh, I agree with the chairman. Um, while I wasn't on the commission, um, I did serve right before you came on board uh, and um, understand what the needs are very clearly and was um, in support of us going after um, this type of uh, funding source to help out. And um, I would like to know, it's the, what's the split between the county and the city? Just curious um, if there's, I mean, or is it 50-50? No, it's <laughs> Well, that's why I wanted <laughs> Well, and you can provide that to me later, but uh, I am in support of this, um, and, and you, Andrew, as well. Um, you've been out to uh, a number of the neighborhood meetings, and um, folks seem to like you as well. Um, and so um, I think you're doing some great things over there and want to support that. Uh, it, <coughs> there's a tremendous task, um, and um, um, so, um, Thank you for what you do. Thank you, sir. Uh, commissioners, anyone else have any questions, Mr. Burroughs? Or um, if not, I, uh, Mr. Burroughs, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to call for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'd make a motion to um, approve the $15 million loan to the uh, Glen Brunswick Joint Water 
sewer commission um, with the environmental finance authority uh, loan to the JWSC. Second. Okay, did y'all want to condition that on city approval? Okay. All right. Okay. You think we should? I mean, uh, should we condition that on the city approving it? That's entirely up to the board. Hmm? That's entirely up to the to you, commissioners. You don't want to condition that on the approval of city. It's take joint. It all, take it all on ourselves. It's jointly and severally. You're taking it on yourself at the city. You got it all anyway. But uh, just for the record, GFO will not give us the loan unless both of you approve it. So oh, okay. you can you can make your motion contingent, but uh, even okay. if you pass it, they won't uh, get uh, it to that's us. That's good. That's good. Uh, we 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 ain't enough by ourselves anyhow. So good. We have a motion. We have a uh, second. Is there any further discussion? <coughs> okay. Uh, call the motion. All those in favor, signify by raising right hand. That is unanimous. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, item 18. Andrew, thank you. Um, item 18. Consider adopting a resolution extending the moratorium on the enforcement of the Glen County Personal Transportation Vehicle Ordinance and for other purposes for a period of 180 days expiring on July 13, 2020 at 11.59 p.m. Uh, Commissioners, y'all know what this is about. Yep. All right, y'all want to let's get on with a motion. <laughs> I don't think we got any choice. Uh, well, let's hear a motion. Where's the motion? Somebody make a motion. David, that's your group over there, buddy. Why don't you make the motion? I can't find the motion to read. Where is it in here? Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, Commissioner, I call the motion. All those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, item 19, we voted to pull it and replace it with item 20. Item 20, consider changing the target election date for the special purpose local option sales tax, SPLOS 2020. Referendum from May 19, 2020 to November 3, 2020. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve changing the target election date for the special purpose local option sales tax plus 2020 referendum from May 19, 2020 to November the 3rd, 2020. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Any further discussion? Okay, I call the motion. All those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. That is unanimous. Thank you, commissioners. Um, Mr. Turney, do we have anything for executive session? Yes, sir, we do. We have uh, matters of property acquisition as well as potential litigation to discuss. Okay, we need a motion to go into executive session. Motion to go into executive session. Second. We have a motion. Have a second. All those in favor, second five, raise your right hand. That is unanimous. We are adjourned. And
Second. Motion second. raise your right hand. Mr. Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, move we approve the minutes of the December 19th uh, meeting. Second. Motion second on the minutes. All those in favor, signal five, raise your right hand. Mr. Chairman, move we approve the recommendation by the county attorney regarding potential litigation. Second. second. Motion second. All those in favor, signal five, raise your right hand. That is unanimous. And motion to. In a, in, a, in a motion to. Oh, oh no, oh, okay. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay. What are we doing? All right, we are adjourned.